The Andy Poland Show. We got to go after this with everything we got, thinking they're going to come with everything they got. I'll start off by saying I'm bored, I'm broke, and I'm back. The Andy Poland Show on ESPN 630 starts right now. Hey, hot enough for you? Ha 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 ha. Yeah, how many times did you hear that over the weekend? Oh my God. Today, it's supposed to stay under 90 degrees. It's going to feel like February out there. What a hot weekend. That was. Uh, we'll talk about the crazy ending to the Nationals game on Saturday night. First time in history that we had a walk-off pitch clock violation by Kyle Finnegan, who yesterday made up for it by closing out a rare 2-1 to victory at Coors Field. That just never happens there, but the Nationals managed to get it done. And they're starting a big series tonight. Yeah, they're a half game behind San Diego for the last wild card spot. We got a game seven. In the Stanley Cup playoffs, unbelievable. It happened once in 1942 in the finals. It has not happened since, though. It's happened, I think, twice in other series, other playoff series. But the Edmonton Oilers, who were left for dead after losing the first three games of the series, have now won three straight, and that sets up a game seven for tonight. Ray Ferraro did a preview last night with Scott Van Pelt. We'll play some of that. Coming up at 10 o'clock, talk a little bit about it. But uh, let me just start with uh, how hot it was on Saturday. I did about the only thing you can do in that kind of weather. Uh, either you go to the pool or you go to the movies. That's really about it. Although I did see someone out jogging, which was insane. Uh, hopefully he had had enough water. But uh, that was not an advisable thing to do in that heat. So uh, I went to see a movie that uh, got a pretty good review. I was, I was intrigued by it. it uh, it's called The Bike Riders. It was too hot for me to ride my bike, but this was about a motorcycle gang in the late, or no, early, early 1960s. And it's, uh, it's based on a book by that title, The Bike Riders, uh, which was written and photographed by Danny Lyon. Uh, it was a, it was a gang of, of motorcycle guys, just like you would have seen in the in the Wild Bunch or uh, you know any of these 1950s motorcycle movies. In fact, you know this was life imitating art. The guy who decided to start this motorcycle club, and I put that in air quotes, uh, had seen uh, Marlon Brando in, in the Wild One. I think it was Wild Ones, not the Wild Bunch, but the Wild Ones, and uh, decided that uh, in Chicago he would start this, and so. Um, yeah, right out of college, I guess, this, this guy, Danny Lyon, decided that would be a cool thing to do, take pictures of the gang and, and write about them, do interviews. And so they based the movie on that book, which came out, I guess, in the late 1960s. There are two key characters in this, Austin Butler, who plays Benny, and Jody Comer, who plays Kathy. And she essentially serves the Ray Liotta role from Goodfellas. She, she kind of narrates the movie as it goes along. And, you know, I thought for, you know, getting out of the heat and uh, spending a, a couple of hours. And, uh, and by the way, the uh, previews, they go, previews of other films go half an hour. I clocked it. It was supposed to start at 110. It started at 140, but whatever. Okay. I get out of the theater. It's about 4 o'clock. About 4 o'clock by the time I, uh, I leave the theater. And, uh, and so I, um, you know, I, I kind of wonder, you know, uh, how hot it is. Well, I don't have to wonder long because on my dashboard, the temperature says 101. I've never seen that before. I've seen screenshots of people driving around Arizona where it gets to be like, you know, 106, 107. But this is the nation's capital. Yeah, it gets hot here and it gets sticky and humid and all that. But 101, 101 on Saturday. I guess it was slightly cooler yesterday, but probably not by much. And uh, today, uh, under 90 degrees, I'll take it. I'll take it. All right, uh, on to the baseball. And uh, I was not up to see this late Saturday night, but we had history made by Kyle Finnegan, who uh, has been very, very good this year. Uh, what, did, what was his uh, – he picked up a save yesterday. Let me check the uh, number on the save. Um, yeah, 22. He had his 22nd save. So he's going for that on Saturday night. Nationals up a run in Colorado. And he allows the Rockies to get the tying run. So it's 7-7. But they got the bases loaded, bottom of the ninth inning. He's got a 3-2 and two count. And you figure, okay, uh, he gets this guy. Maybe he gets out of this jam, goes to extra innings. No. No pitch. 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 pitch clock for oh Arlo. She's going to end the game. Wow. Jake Cage 
scores. Rockies win it eight to seven. Finnegan doesn't even argue, just walks off. What a resilient victory for the Rockies. Maybe lost a little bit of the drama with the walk-off pitch clock violation. Yeah, and, and he did not argue. Uh, I watched Davey Martinez's news conference after the game. He really you know, didn't put up much of a stink about it. And Finnegan has been doing that. That's the ninth time that he's had a pitch clock violation this season. That's the most in the major leagues, though – uh, none of the others have been as damaging as this one where it, it cost them the game. I'll give him credit for this. Uh, after the game, Kyle Finnegan Saturday night was, you know, taking the blame for it. He wasn't blaming the umpire. You know, you would think that there'd be some kind of umpire's discretion, especially in that situation. They didn't use it. And Finnegan really, as it sounds like, didn't have a problem. And I thought I, I picked up the clock. And um, I guess by the time I picked up and, looked at the catcher and delivered the pitch I was you know just a hair too late um you know those those situations that it just can't happen it can't happen as soon as you saw what the ruling was the violation um just what went through your head well at first you know I didn't really know what what he called because I thought I you know I thought I was right on time um I wasn't so it kind of dawned on me that I was too late and um just immediately you know Felt awful about, you know, letting the team down in that big spot there. Um, to lose the game in that way is just, it just can't happen. Well, uh, it was less than 24 hours that he had to deal with this because yesterday he gets called back in. Now, this is, was in a very unusual game in that the Nationals couldn't get anything going uh, for eight innings. Finally, in the ninth inning, they score two runs to go ahead 2-1. Two 2-1. To one. Two one. So in comes Finnegan. Now, you know, Finnegan has just made history the night before. He's the first pitcher ever to allow a walk-off pitch clock violation. And as you can imagine, he's you know having a tough time dealing with that overnight. And, and now he's pitching 16 hours later, 17 hours later. And what do you know? The same thing that had happened the night before where he was giving up single after single, allowing the Rockies to tie the game and ultimately win the game. Uh, he gives up to the first two batters singles. So now you got runners on first and second, nobody out, but then he manages to shut the door. Nationals win two to one. Finnegan gets his 22nd save and then talks to Masson's Dan Colco. Kyle, after everything that happened last night, you allowed two singles to start your outing today. We had a shot of you outwardly after that second single today. You were showing no signs of frustration. What was going on internally after you allowed the first two to reach? Well, you know, last night was a long night for me, not a lot of sleep, and I was just chomping at the bit, hoping I'd get the opportunity to come out here again today. And uh, the boys played an unbelievable game, put us in a, in a position to win, and, and you know, I go out there, and, and it was like yesterday spilled over into today. I felt like I was making some good pitches, and they're just, you know, they're just doing their job, and they're hitting it where we're not, and that happens in this game, and, and you can't let it change the way you're you're attacking guys and you know I just stuck with our plan and and understood that I felt like I was executing pitches and and it would turn on us and then uh, sure enough was able to get an out and a couple strikeouts and um, you know I'm just proud of our team hanging in here and and this is a tough place to play and to win two out of three is awesome. Kyle I was going to ask you every ball player deals with adversity differently and you're going to encounter a lot of it in this game how do you as a closer bounce back from an unsuccessful outing Learn from it whatever you need to and then turn the page from it as quickly as you can. Yeah, for me, most of the time um, when I take a shower after the game, I'm, I'm like washing that day away from me and uh, try not to take it home back to the hotel or back to my family. Uh, some are harder than others. Yesterday was one of those. I, you know, I thought about it a lot and what could I have done differently, you know, so on and so forth. And But it just comes down to getting back out there for me. You know, as, as quick as you can put it put it behind you, um, you can move forward and, and – I was happy to get back out there today and, and get the job done. Turn the page, boys. It's a 162-game season and Finnegan bouncing back yesterday. But here's the question. This happened in a regular season game. It happened in a eh, relatively meaningless game. Colorado's a last-place team. Nationals may be in the playoff mix. They're only a half game out of the wild card. So, you know, who knows what's going to happen over the second half of the season. 
But uh, in terms of, you know, this was not exactly, you know, Yankees and Orioles or, you know, Dodgers and Padres or something. I mean, it was a it was a run of the mill game on Saturday night. Would not have gotten any kind of notice had not we had this record. But what happens in the World Series? This is what we asked when the new rule came in. Well, what if it comes down to game seven of the World Series and can a team win on a walk off pitch clock violation? Yeah, theoretically, they could. But I think it has to be made clear that the umpires have discretion. And if you watch the highlight of this from Saturday night or saw it live, the pitch was pretty much in the air when the game was called. Like, it wasn't like he went over by five seconds. He went over by a second or so. So I would think it would be up to the umpire to look at that situation and say, yeah, we just can't end it that way. Now, if it's, you know, if he goes five seconds over, obviously, if he's still holding on to the ball and – you know, peering in for the signs or, you know, whatever he's doing to not throw the pitch, then you call it. But if it's that close, I think you let it go. And uh, I'm not going to kick up too much of a fuss about this. Davey Martinez didn't. Kyle Finnegan didn't. And he had the ultimate comeback yesterday by being able to shut the door and pick up his 20-second save. So big series starting tonight. Yeah, I say big series. They haven't completed half the season yet. They played, I think, 79 games or 77 games, some, somewhere in that neighborhood. So they're not quite at the 81-game mark. But, you know, when we get to the end of the season, how they do against the Padres in this series could be key, especially if those are the two teams that are fighting for the last wild card spot, as they are now. Uh, WNBA, I, I don't quite get the Mystics. They started off 0-12. Now they won four out of five, and they took two from Dallas over the weekend. They uh, they had some odd scheduling. They played Dallas both Saturday and Sunday here. That gets to cut down on the travel, even though uh, WNBA players are now traveling by charter, not uh, commercial. But uh, suddenly they're not so bad. They're out of last place, and uh, I don't really know what to make of them, but – Good for them, and uh, and maybe they turn this into a reasonably successful season. I don't think they'll be a playoff team, but uh, but to uh, start 0-12 and, and then 4 out of 5, that's, that's pretty good. But the game that got the attention yesterday and was in a nice spot for ESPN, most of the baseball was over by then. It was a 4 o'clock game, so it's ending 6-ish or so. And it's another game between the Chicago Sky and the Indiana Fever. And this isn't quite – magic and bird but it's it's big for the WNBA because what you have here is Angel Reese who's become the villain and Caitlin Clark who in the eyes of some is the savior of the WNBA and in the eyes of others villainous I'll get to that in a second but this looked like this is going to be a runaway game um they, this this uh, I think they're up uh, 17 points uh, Indiana was. They're playing at Chicago. It's a it's a hot ticket. Uh, tickets are going for about three hundred and fifty dollars a piece on the secondary market, and you got this great history between Angel Reese and Caitlin Clark going back to their junior years of college when they played for the national championship and LSU with Reese won, and she's been very outspoken about you know how the league isn't just Caitlin Clark, and they come to see her play as well. Well, she, she's a supporting character in this, and, and I'll get to the editorial that was written by Karen Ataya in the Post over the weekend, but uh, y- y- I have to look at this. I don't know how you look at this, but I look at this as, you know, Caitlin Clark is the story. She is, she is the polarizing figure, no, not on any, uh, any effort of her own. It's just because of the way she's viewed at uh, in, in the prism of what's going on here in the WNBA. But uh, Reese gets this one, and she came up big at the end. I was watching the end of this game. Caitlin Clark was, uh, even though she set a franchise record with 13 assists, she was hesitant to shoot at the end of the game. And I think if you're Caitlin Clark and you're going to be the big player in the league someday, you got to do what you did in college. You got drafted because you were willing to take those shots and take them from anywhere, from the logo. And she was passing up open shots to pass, and she said, well, maybe I should have shot some of those, but uh, I trust my teammates. Meantime, Angel Reese, she's not making any bones about it. She's the one who took the team on her back, and she's the team that was able to engineer this come-from-behind victory, 88-87, with 25 points and 16 rebounds, and talked about it after the game. Well, Angel, your team was down by 15 points, and you personally started the run that won this game. How do you find this in you each and every time to be such a winner? I'm a dog. You can't teach that. I'm going to go out and do whatever it takes to win every single night. My teammates allow my energy. 
energy. So being able to continue the energy, even if we're down, even if we're up, that's what I, that's what I do. It was a career night for you, the best performance you've ever had in the WNBA yeah. so far. What does that mean to you? I try to give myself some grace. I'm really hard on myself. I mean, I'm happy we won. I'm, I'm so happy we won. That matters most anything, but I got to get back to work, and we got to get back to work for our next game. I see you put your arm around Kennedy Carter late in the game. I see that leadership. You've done it for years. What is the message you're telling her? Because she was terrific today. Hey, me and Kennedy, we have a different kind of relationship. We've been through a lot of the same things. A lot of people have misconceptions about us. We understand each other, and that's why I love her. She can get to me. I can get to her. She a dog, too. She, she came out and did so much for us tonight. This is a team effort, and I, I'm, I'm just hoping so happy for this team. Everybody wants to know if this is a budding rivalry. This is the first win. If it is or if it isn't, what do you think? Hey, it's just good competition. I'm happy. I mean, they still got us. They got one up on us, so I'm just happy for the team, and I want to make it about us. I just want our team. Chicago, they came out tonight, so I'm just happy for us. You came over to give some respect and love to Cheryl Swoops. What does that mean to you? And that moment is so beautiful. Hey, she's been there for me. She's been there through me through my highs and my lows. She never doubted me. She knew coming into the league what I was going to be capable of. She said she's proud of me, and I just continued to just being able to talk to her and have somebody like that in my life. So I'm just happy I came over there. And just, she told me she was coming to the game, so I, I'm going to put on a show for you. Reese referred to as Kennedy Carter. I think it's Kennedy Carter, and uh, she's the one that was in the eye of the storm when Caitlin Clark was standing near the baseline, and she just plowed into her, uh, did not get a flagrant, just a, a technical foul, and uh, – and that was a game that uh, drew a lot of attention about three weeks ago. And uh, they get the rematch yesterday. Now, again, uh, Angel Reese can talk about all the people that came out to see her. But <laughs> the sellout crowd was there to see Caitlin Clark. There's just no getting around it. Uh, there's, there's the story that Angel Reese helps to create with her rivalry, the rivalry that she gins up in every game. And, and this just adds to it with what she was able to do yesterday. She was the better player on the floor with 25 points and 16 rebounds. But to me, anyway, as a white male, a white middle-aged male, it's, it's still the Caitlin Clark show, which leads me to an editorial that was written by Karen Ataya in The Post. She's a 37-year-old African-American woman, uh, is, uh, is a journalist with The Post, and uh, she wrote uh, a, an editorial, which the headline is Calling Foul on the Caitlin Clark Fan Club. And she says, to listen to Clark's extreme fans, she alone, the divine spirit, is elevating the sport. Enjoying the 22-year-old newcomer from the University of Iowa is not enough. Her acolytes demand that all fans and the league itself must bow down and express gratitude for the interest in Clark, especially the interest from white and male audience. Implicit is a threat that if Clark doesn't get what they believe <coughs> that audience deserves, their interest could be taken away at any time. Given that the WNBA is more than 60 percent black, it's hard not to feel like the new fans are using Clark as a proxy for their own issues and attitudes about race, sexuality, and gender. I don't think I would go that far. I don't think so. I think we're, as, as a representative of that audience that she's ripping here, uh, I think we're more intrigued by this woman who was shooting from the logos in college and, and you know, scoring points like nobody has ever done before, even more than Pete Maravich. She had a longer career, and women's basketball is different than, than men's basketball, but she was a comet in women's college basketball. She was. And that's, you know, if, if she were black, I don't think I would be anywhere less excited about her or, or less interest in what she was doing. She was a spectacular shooter. She was shooting from places where people have not shot before. <clears throat> then she uh, then she takes Christine Brennan to task. Uh, excuse me, <clears throat> Christine Brennan for um, for what she wrote in USA Today, uh, describing the Olympic decision to leave her off as a snub and charge that USA Basketball quote dumped Clark. Barstool Sports came out with a T-shirt with five five images of Clark, each holding one of the five Olympic rings. The only player that matters, the shirt deserves. I think that's a little unfair to compare what Christine does to what Barstool does. But uh, that's that's her take on that. Um, she also says Clark is rising into the great and growing tradition of women's basketball and doing it with grace and maturity. So she does give her credit for that. But she just arrived at the WNBA. Her fans need to follow her example and respect what the women before her have built. 
but this is the crux of our culture and pol- and political moment, right? The rise of the WNBA coincides with a broader wave of conservative male forces claiming to save America from various threats, critical race theory, DEI, migrants of color, and LGBTQ plus people. Clark isn't asking to be saved from anything. Her extremist fans should pipe down. Um I mean, it's a good, it's well written. It's 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 a good take on this. I don't happen to agree with it, and uh, and I I wonder, you know, with all that was built by the people before, and there have been some great players in the WNBA. Make no mistake about that, including Cheryl Swoops, who was there to, to watch yesterday. But the rocket ship interest in the league is based on this woman, and. Maybe I'm naive, but I don't necessarily think it's because she's white and straight. I think that's a a factor in this, but I don't think that's the whole story. And for her to go out and say that Clark is a proxy for our issues and attitudes about race, sexuality, and gender, I'm not necessarily buying that. But it makes for good discussion and, uh, and again, uh, an interesting, uh, interesting perspective from someone who's young a woman and uh, African American. I, I don't think she was an athlete. Uh, she is a, a, a journalist with the Washington Post, Winston Northwestern. All right, uh, we played this on Friday, but I played it in the ten o'clock hour. So if you didn't hear it and haven't heard it yet, haven't watched it on YouTube or didn't see it live, uh, Terry McLaurin showed up in the studio with Scott Van Pelt, and we're in that you know kind of a lull here. We don't get training camp going for another month. The veterans are due to report, by the way, a month from today. So uh, interesting to hear uh, what McLaurin uh, felt about uh, the way minicamp went, the way the offseason workouts went. And as he looks ahead to year six, wants to be a winner, uh, what he said to Scott Van Pelt about that. We'll get to that more as we continue. It's the Andy Poland Show, ESPN 630. The Andy Poland Show on ESPN 630, the sports capital. We got Tony coming up at 11 o'clock today. In fact, he's uh, adjusted his schedule a little bit this week, so he's doing Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of this week. And uh, I know what a Max Scherzer fan he is. Calls him the warrior god. And uh, if you didn't see this yesterday, Scherzer uh, came back, played the first game of the season, made his first start since game three of the World Series, and still has it. (laughs) Got the first 13 of the uh, batters that he faced, 15 of 16 overall, five innings. Rangers won 4-0 over the Royals. Max is not quite 40. You know, it, it seems like we've been talking about Max Scherzer for like 25 years. But uh, he's still 39 years old. He still ha- may have something left in the tank. And he's playing for a team that, you know, could be in the mix this year. They're right now three games under 500, but still half a season to go. And if he stays healthy and can be healthy for the postseason, wouldn't you want him out on the mound? I sure would. Uh, Max Scherzer, <laughs> 39 years old and, uh, you know, not doing it for the money, though he's making plenty of money. Uh, he's still got the passion, still got the fire, and you watch the highlights, and he's still prancing around the mound like he used to do. I mean, that, those were some fun days, weren't they? That when Max was dominant, there was there was nothing like watching a Max Scherzer start for the Nationals, and uh, I really missed that. But eh, Nats are doing okay now. They're uh, uh, game under five hundred, the elusive five hundred. Maybe they get it tonight in San Diego. If they do, they overtake the Padres for that last wild card spot. And uh, could turn out to be a fun season after all. Uh, on Thursday, uh, after the uh, Commanders wrapped up their mini camp, uh, Terry McLaurin showed up on the Scott Van Pelt Sports Center, which he does out of Washington D.C. Uses the same studio that Tony and Mike use for PTI. And uh, the convenience of this really cool. Uh, McLaurin is is has been voted every year he's played for the team uh, the number one. Uh, media guy. I don't know what they call it. Good guy award, I guess is what they call it. And uh, I've never seen him in an interview situation where he's snapped at anybody. He seems to enjoy the give and take. He listens to the questions. He's a true mensch, true mensch. So Klorn, uh came into the studio. And obviously, if you're going to talk about the commanders, especially on a national show, the first thing you're going to ask about is Jaden Daniels, which is exactly what SVP did. I think the first thing that's, that stood out to me about Jaden Daniels is the poise he came into the first day in the building. Um, By the time the rookies got there, we pretty much had four or five installs in. And I think Coach Kingsbury uh, did a great job of 
trying to integrate everybody at the same time. So when the rookies got there, we, we started from ground one, but it seemed like he knew the entire offense when we got there. He's in there calling the huddles through the walkthroughs. He's in there calling the plays and he's extremely confident. And um, it, it's a testament to his preparation and his studying that he did on his own. Mm -hmm. But also I just think the kid loves ball and, he, and he, he has a good feel for the game. So I think he really came in with the right mindset and energy and guys are already gravitating to him. It's really difficult in this in this league for rookies at this position to have success. Although, C.J. Stroud, where did he go to school? Ohio State. The Ohio State the. University. He, <laughs> he came in, and we talked to him about that last yeah. year. He's a young man leading a group of grown men, and he was fantastic. To mm -hmm. give a rookie at that position the best chance to be successful quickly, mm -hmm. Terry, what do you feel like you all have to do? Um, honestly, I think a big part of it comes from the makeup of that quarterback. To be honest, I think I have a history with C.J. Stroud, just knowing him and getting to know him and what he's made up of and the adversity he went through at Ohio State. And sure. it built him for what he was ready for now. And I think Jaden Daniels has a similar story to where he started out at Arizona State, right. goes to LSU, um, has a good first year. But that second year, he takes off, man, and he wins the Heisman. He has them in contention for the playoffs. And um, he's just used to winning and used to what it looks like to be a, a really successful player. Mm -hmm. And as a leader and as a, his wide receiver, I would just want to be the best player I can for him. So um, I'm going to push him. I know he's going to push me, but I think he you don't have to tell him what to do when it comes to practice. Like right. he's out there early. He's getting warmed up. And if he doesn't like a rep that went down in practice, he's like, hey, Terry, let's come over here. Let's get this rep again. Run it back. And yeah, run it back. And I think that that's, that's a testament to his his work ethic and how he tries to prepare each and every day in practice because he treats every practice and every rep like it's a game rep situation. As, as one of the top wideouts in the league, obviously you want to try to create that bond and that chemistry with yeah. this young guy. I've been reading about that, putting in this work. How, how important is that? Just yeah. very quickly, just to get an idea, him for you and you for him, right. so that when we get to September and you play yeah. Tampa Bay to start your season, like you all are on that same page. Same page. What goes into that? Honestly, I think it first starts to get to know the person. And him and I have... We got to talk when he got drafted, and we've gotten to uh, get to know each other over this offseason time. And so I, it's important. To, excuse me for interrupting, but just yeah. knowing the human being just yeah. before you, and like the football is the football, but, but just getting to have that vibe as human beings. Yes, 100 percent. Because I think with any line of work that you're in uh -huh. is still about the people. It's still about the connection. It's right. still about getting to know one another, the person that you're going to be going to work with, or in our case, you're going to battle. You know what right. I mean? And you got to know he has to be able to trust. I'm going to be. Um, where I'm going to be when he needs me to be there. Like I'm going to be on the spot. I'm not going to uh, cut my depth short. I'm not going to uh, fade away on an in cut and let the DB undercut me. Like He has to trust that I'm going to do my job, and I have to trust that he's going to do his. Mm -hmm. And I think that really starts when you get to know someone because um, you, you get to learn what they're about. You get to learn their whys and, and why they, they put the time and the effort into what they're doing. And then it's honestly easier when you have that connection to be honest, you know what I mean? Like we don't take any conversations that we have in our building amongst teammates personal because we know our brothers are looking out for us right. and they just want the best for not only us, but the entire team. So um, I think he exudes that and um, our personal relationship, I think is really going to help um, us and our entire group as we go forward. Terry McClure in part one of his conversation with Scott Van Pelt last week, get to part two in a second, but you know, here's his, I think it's going to be that whenever Daniel starts or, or, you know, could be Marcus Mariota in the, in the uh, opener or a few games into that, who knows how long it's going to take Daniels to get ready. But at some point uh, you're, you're going to have a 14th different starting quarterback for Terry McLaurin, which is, you know, just amazing. Uh, the last 18 games have been with Sam Howell, but it's been one QB after another since he got here in 2019. And over that period of time, He's played in one playoff game, which was uh, his second year, and, uh, and that was on a losing team. And he has been on one team that didn't finish below 500. They were 8-8-1. Eight, eight and one. That's the best he's done in five years on the league, in the league. And since McLaurin is the antithesis of a diva wide receiver, what you're not hearing from him is, get me out of here, get me to a winner. That would happen with a lot of players of his talent. Hasn't done that. Now, he got paid here, and he has been very gracious in his time here. But, you know, he's he took a redshirt year at Ohio State, so he's going into his sixth year, and he's tickling 30 years old. 
receivers don't last much longer than that. You know, the the rare exceptions are the guys like Jerry Rice who play into their 40s. That's probably not going to happen with him. And at, at some point, he'd like to play on a winning team. But he's not going to be a problem about this. And this was SVP discussing that with McLaurin as he heads into year six. I think I try to stay in in my process. And I think when I was young, like you look around guys in, in the league and your peers, you're like, man, I could do what they're doing. Sure. You know what I mean? And I think people can't necessarily appreciate um, as a receiver. I, I feel like you play probably one of the most dependent it's one of the most dependent positions on the field because um, from the play calling to you have to be able to know what you're doing and, and get open and um, the offensive line has to do their job, quarterback and all those things. But I think for me, I've really gotten comfortable being uncomfortable. You know what I mean? I, I don't try to stress who's going to be back there at quarterback, but just knowing that I'm going to be prepared right. uh, when, my, when my number is called. And so it's kind of like a no excuse mentality where um, all those things are factors in the, in their pieces to the puzzle, but I'll never hang my hat and use that as an excuse from the, um, unpredictability, unpredictability it's been at times. I feel like your position is one where a, 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 a healthy bit of ego is required. Yeah. When you look at these numbers right here and yeah. you look at the dudes that you're on that list with Devontae wow. Adams, Stephon Diggs, Tyreek Hill, you yeah. 75 and a grand each of the last four seasons. That yeah. speaks to a level of a high level of high achievement mm-hmm. and consistency. Folks might not know that you're that that you'd be the answer that yeah. you're number four on that list. 100%. What kind of fuel does that provide? It's a team yeah. sport, but you're it's, you play a very individual position. So Definitely. I just wonder what the sort of the motivation was. There. Definitely, I think the the balance is is knowing like I feel like when I'm involved in the game in the in the not only the my level of play that I bring to our team, but the energy and the leadership. And when I make a play, I feel like not only our team feels it, but the, the whole building feels it. Like it's true. I've been in the games where I can hear the fans, Terry, Terry, because I haven't got the ball yet. And I love that support. And I just try to uh, be ready when my number is called. And you want to be looked at as one of the top receivers in, in the league. I don't play this game not only uh, not for the money and not for the notoriety, but I play to win – championships and be the best at my craft Mm -hmm. and uh, I'm I'm making sure that I put the time and work in so I'm prepared for those moments but at the same time um, knowing that I have to be able to raise my level of play and bring other guys along with me um, if we're going to be successful and I think our coaching staff has done a great job of keeping things simple we haven't over over complicated anything this offseason we've gotten to know each other and the offense has really been installed in a way where guys can uh, be on the same page and and really start to grow from the ground up. And um, I just want to be that catalyst for our team in the locker room, on the field, um, and off the field, because um, that's who I prepare to be each and every day. That's who I feel like I was, I was born to be. This is a low-hanging fruit question, but mm-hmm. I'm, I'm sincerely interested in the answer. Success for, for the Washington Commanders this year. Yeah. What's that in your mind as we talk in the middle of June? What, yeah. What's that look like? What, what feels yeah. like a reasonable thing to say, look, we can – Take a step and do this. Yeah. Honestly, uh, and I'm not going to even go into record because I'm not this, asking you that. Yeah, and there's so many things I feel like that go into that that people don't appreciate. I think that's the the standard in which people look at look at their record. But I think um, offensively, you'll see uh, an offense this year who's playing with a lot of energy, who's playing together, who's playing unbelievable out the ball. You, if I were to show you our practice clips, you see guys who don't have the ball running down the field to get a block. That's been an emphasis from uh, Cliff and our entire office of staff. Um, and we've seen some other teams, San Francisco, to mention one of them. They play great without the ball. And I think that's a, a testament to um, the unselfishness that you have to have to have success as an offense. There's only one ball that could go around. But if you've got guys who are uh, playing hard without the ball in their hand, and when they do have the ball in their hand, they're protecting it, they're making cuts, they're trying to do something with it, you're going to have success. And defensively, it's been, it's been tough going against them in, in the spring so far, even though we ain't got pads on because they're tenacious. And I think um, Coach Witt and obviously Coach Quinn, um, they're emphasizing turnovers. So you got guys flying all over the field, getting picks, punch, trying to punch the ball out. It's just a tenacity that I feel like that we possibly miss in the past that I feel like is really there. Right and when you got guys focused on one mission who have the connection that I feel like we're building, who have the practice and the work ethic and the the good habits we're trying to form in this time, and then you got guys going out there who love football and love to compete, I think you have a chance to be successful. So I think those foundational pieces that may not show up on the wins-loss score, but it definitely 
adds to the, the bigger puzzle. So I think if we continue doing those things as we go into this offseason, everybody's, you're trusting everybody's going to do their job and be ready to come back for camp. And so we can get this thing rolling. That's Terry McLaurin with Scott Van Pelt last week. They're a month away from opening training camp. But, boy, you hope it works out, you know, just for him. E- even if, you know, you're a casual fan of the team and your expectations are not high, this guy has given everything over five years and a real success story. In fact, when he was drafted – in 2019 he went in the third round I really wasn't familiar with him from Ohio State because he was like their third or fourth leading receiver you know he was not high on the radar and you heard Dwayne Haskins who was his teammate say yeah uh, I'm, I'm really glad they drafted him and I thought oh my god this is like how they used to do business where they would listen to a star player Uh, tell them what to do. This was a player who hadn't done anything yet who was a rookie, you know, star-crossed, and and sadly is no longer with us. But I thought, oh, my God, they're they're listening to a draft pick tell you who to take. And the expectation for McLaurin going into that rookie year was, you know, maybe play special teams and they work him in as like a third or fourth wide receiver. And it was pretty clear that he was going to outwork everybody. Uh, He had a great ability to track the ball, which he said was his weakness at Ohio State those what they call 50-50 balls that he would jump up and catch. He said he really worked hard to overcome what was a weakness for him. Now it's one of his strengths. And week after week, no matter who the quarterback is, no matter how the team is performing, he gives you everything. And as you know, Scott referenced in the, in the conversation there about the receivers, he's one of four that's had 75 catches and 1,000 yards the last four years. That's consistency. That's staying on the field. That's staying healthy. He's done everything right. And uh, I I wonder what's going to happen to him after he finishes playing football. He could probably coach. He could do anything he wants to do. If he wants to get into broadcasting, he can do that. Uh, If he wants to be a coach, he can be a coach. He could probably wind up as a head coach one day. I'd like to see him become mayor. I I think he's got that kind of ability, and I think he's got – the, uh, the the leadership that people look for, people want to follow him. And, and as an example of what to be as a professional athlete, I don't think you can find a better one than Terry McLaurin. Is he among the four or five best receivers in the league? Probably not, but he's probably among the top 15. And, you know, if, if you get the right circumstance with the right quarterback, if Jaden Daniels is that guy and this offense with Cliff Kingsbury – you know, maybe he steps up and, and has an elite type of season. He hasn't really had quite an elite career yet. He's had an outstanding career, not a Hall of Fame career, and isn't tracking that way. But he has done everything you could possibly do under the most trying of circumstances. This organization has been a mess in his five years here. And maybe in year six, things finally start to go right for him. We'll get to uh, we'll get to more on the NBA coming up. Chris Mannix, who covers the league for SI.com, was on the Rich Eisen show last Friday. We'll play some of what he thinks uh, as we head into the draft. Plus, it's Game 7 tonight in the Stanley Cup Finals. Preview next. All right, we've got the NBA draft this week. It's spread out over two nights. And actually, that's a pretty good thing for the NBA this year, only because of the Bronny James intrigue. As we go forward, you know, the second round over the years has been kind of a yawner. Um, there's interest in Bronny and what's going to happen there, so people will tune in on Friday night for round two. But, you know, the NFL makes it work for three days. I don't know if the NBA can make this happen for two nights, but eh, it's sports. It's on TV. The networks love programming from sports, and even though it's not a game, People will tune in for that, so we'll talk about that uh, coming up shortly. Also, uh, in regards to that, it was 14 years ago today that John Wall was the number one pick of the draft, and people were truly excited. It's this year the number two pick for the Wizards, and it's a big yawn because (laughs) nobody really knows who's in the draft. Maybe it's another French player that they take. There's a couple of guys from college basketball uh, who are drawing some interest, but uh, nobody really in town is, is that excited about the NBA draft. But there was great excitement 14 years ago tonight that John Wall was going to be a great player for the Wizards. And by and large, he was really, really good. Did he reach expectations? No. Was his career tinged by injuries? Yes, it was. Uh, did they get to where they wanted to get to? Well, they were getting close when they won game six, and he stood on the table, but then the Celtics won Game 7. Speaking of the Celtics, after they lost Game 4 in Dallas, we said, 
well, sooner or later, somebody's going to come back from 3-0. It's happened in baseball. It's happened in hockey a few times. Could it happen in the NBA? Nah, probably not this year. And it wasn't going to happen because Dallas went out with a whimper in Game 5 in Boston a week ago tonight. We've already had the parade, and we move on from that. Uh, But in hockey, uh, it has happened before. It's happened a couple of times in the playoffs, and it happened once before in the Stanley Cup Finals, 1942, that a team came from 3-0 down to win the championship. We're on the cusp of it tonight, and there's real reason to believe that it's going to happen. Uh, What the Maple Leafs were able to do in 1942 could be done by the Edmonton Oilers tonight. Now, they have to get it done on the road in Florida where – you know, it looked like the Panthers in the first couple of games of the series were clearly the better team. You, you heard analysts like P.K. Subban say, yeah, they just got more talent. Uh, and, and then it flipped. The series has flipped in the last three games. The momentum is clearly with the Oilers. And since it's happened a couple of times in the playoffs, and, okay, you have to go back to 1942 for it to happen in the finals – everything, you know, eventually does happen. And it's quite conceivable that Edmonton gets it done tonight. Can they do it? Scott Van Pelt last night on his show talking to ESPN hockey analyst Ray Ferraro. The 18-5 to goal differential games four through six, it's pretty glaring, right, what's different. But from your vantage point down there on the ice, Ray, I'm interested in what has been most noticeably different between these two clubs from the first three games to the last three games. Well, I, w- I would say, Scott, the, the biggest thing is that uh, the Panthers play at their best, a very aggressive, a very in-your-face style of play. And when they got pumped 8-1 in Game 4, it really felt like they lost their nerve. The way that they have to play is to be physical, to forecheck, to get their defense up into the play. But I think they got spooked. And so now they're not quite as aggressive. They're kind of stuck in the middle. I think the biggest thing for three games is the Panthers don't look – like the team that won the Eastern Conference Championship. They look like a team searching right now, and, man, it's the wrong time of year to be searching. That's, that's well put. And yet, and yet, if you tell them at the start of the Stanley Cup playoff, June 24th, you got a Game 7 in your building, and you win it, and you, and you win the Stanley Cup, right? But you and I and everybody else knows the path right. that led to this Game 7. So it's, I always say, Ray, it's be optimistic because it costs the same I think it's hard to be optimistic right now if you're a Florida mm. Panther because we all know how we got to this point. So knowing that this has all happened, knowing if you lose this game on Monday, you probably think this is never going to happen for us. How do you flush all that negativity and just focus on the opportunity that's in front of them? Well, it's, it's a big chore. I, I think the, the weight of history um, – is, is a big deal. And the history is that only in 1942 is a team lost the first three games of a Stanley Cup championship and been able to come back and win. It's remarkable that it's never happened before because it's almost impossible to do. Yet the Panthers have played themselves backwards into this spot. And I think the biggest thing that the coaches talk about with the Panthers is we take a look in the mirror and we look, what can I do to be better than I was in game six? As much as it's a team game, it's an individual game first. And what I mean by that is I can't be the weakest link in the chain. And so you get to game seven, and if 18 guys and the goaltender do their job, that's all you can ask. Because for the last three games, they haven't been even close. In game six, Alexander Barkov, their captain, was the only guy that could probably walk out of that rink and say, I had a good night. The rest of them was just not where they need to be. Give me a guy not named Connor McDavid who needs to be great for Edmonton for them to win game seven. I obviously take 97 and put him on a different place because he's, he is on a different – yeah. he, he just exists on a different place. So not name McDavid who needs to be great for Edmonton on Monday, right? Well, uh, Leon Dreisaitl has had a really quiet series for the yeah. Oilers. He's got just three assists. He's one of, the, one of the game's best players. And for some reason, this final series has not gone very well for him. He doesn't need five shots on goal to score. He needs one. One power play goal might be the difference. He's the one guy that can be a difference maker that you kind of almost expect it's going to happen. Florida, that's the, the last thought, uh, Ray. And, and obviously, Bobrovsky was great to start, not great lately. So he's, he's got to be critical. But yeah. somebody outside of the keeper for Florida that you say, if this man's great, then they get their hands on the cup for the first time. 
Well, I'm going to give you three because I think they're all lumped together, Scott, and that's uh, uh, Matthew Kachuk, who has got one goal in the series, uh, Carter Verhage, who scored in game one and has not scored since, and Sam Reinhardt, who's got one goal in the series. And the reason I picked those three, in the regular season, they scored over 100 goals combined. In this series, they got three. Wow. You, you got to score. Those are the big boys, and they have to play tomorrow night. Tomorrow night now, tonight, you got to put the puck in the net as uh... – <laughs> As limited hockey uh, knowledgeable people like me say, traffic in front of the net. We'll see. I mean, uh, it'd be cool. It'd be history tonight if uh, Edmonton can pull it off. Not just history going back to 1942 with the last time a team came from 3-0 behind, but the last time a Canadian team won the Stanley Cup was 30 years ago. And that's the national sport there, you know. Uh, and so a team from Edmonton, uh, winning tonight would be uh, would be cool. Bitterly disappointing for the people in Florida who thought they had this thing won at 3-0. And, uh, and now it's 3-3, and we got a Game 7 coming up at 8 o'clock tonight. Oh, um, the, uh, the NBA draft, as you know, is coming up on Thursday night. The Wizards have the number two pick. And according to most of the mock drafts I've seen, they're projecting that Alex Saar from Australia uh, will go to them. Uh, he is... I guess a slightly smaller version of Victor Wembanyama, also very thin, 7'1", 205 pounds, uh, was spotted at Game 4 of the NBA Finals. He's 19 years old, so he has the big upside, elite rim protector with pick-and-pop potential. So we'll see the uh, number one pick, according to uh, several of the mocks, is uh, Zachary Rishishar, Rishishar from uh, France, 6'9", 204. Uh, he would go number one to Atlanta. Sar number two to the Wizards. Donovan Klingon. I've seen his name mentioned as a possibility to the Wizards. The uh, the star center from UConn this past year. 72280. Uh, going to the Houston Rockets at three, and then the Spurs at four would take Stephen Castle, who is his teammate, uh, coming off a of freshman year. And then you know you get more uh, foreign players. You get to Reed Shepard. They're projecting he goes six to Charlotte. You know and. Who knows what's what's ultimately going to happen? But this is a draft that that nobody is excited of, about. Uh, here's a name that you you saw during the tournament: Dalton Connect. He's uh, considered a possibility for Memphis at number nine. But it's you know it's not like it's not like the days where you know you, you sometimes you flip a coin as to who goes number one or number two. And sometimes there's this generational player as there was last year with Wembenyama. It doesn't look like we have that now. Uh, but you know, who knows who develops out of this draft, who becomes the star. But it's 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 a wizard's fortune that in the two times that they've had the number one, number one, they took a bust in Kwame Brown and a player who is good, but not necessarily the long-term answer for them in John Wall. And we'll talk about his drafting 14 years ago today coming up. But Chris Mannix, who covers the league for, ES, or for SI, was on uh, the Breach Eisen show and uh, discussing the focus on LeBron. What is LeBron going to do? How's that going to impact the draft? You've heard that, you know, if, Le if LeBron is drafted by another team, that LeBron is going to go play there. Who knows? But he has opted out of his contract. But, says Mannix, he believes he's coming back to the Lakers. You know, my, my understanding is that the, the Lakers are willing to give LeBron whatever contract he wants. So, whether it's an extension on top of the current deal or a brand new contract, I think he's going to be back uh, in Los Angeles. But by going to free agency and opting out, he can get a three-year deal worth a little north of $150 million. But he can also get a no-trade clause with that deal, which you know, I don't know if LeBron necessarily needs. But there has been some chatter about trading LeBron in recent years uh, as the Lakers have kind of deteriorated. By getting the no trade clause, he could have some power over them in that particular situation. So I, I, I have not heard anything to suggest that LeBron won't be back with the Lakers in some form or another. So LeBron goes back to Los Angeles and do the Lakers use, I don't think so, but they could use the 17th pick on him or their second rounder, number 55. And it sounds like Mannix is leaning towards them using that second rounder to take Bronny. I don't get the sense that any team is overly interested in Bronny right now. Like, that could change. The second round is where you take flyers, yep. right? Like, right. 
just have some fun and go on basketball reference sometime and look at the history of second round picks. That's what I'm saying. If the Lakers are 55th overall, like why not just remove any sort of part of the equation and just bring his son in here? Well, yeah, like I don't think he gets past 55, basically, is, is what I'm saying. Does he get picked by somebody before then? I would call that extremely unlikely. I've had some conversations with team executives, like say like like the Knicks, like they draft Bronny somewhere yeah. in the second round. Like, could they just dare LeBron to yeah. fulfill his destiny and come play in New York for for a year? Philadelphia, but, did they? But do... Didn't Rich Paul say he's not going to sign a two way? He said he's not going to sign a two way. We'll, we'll see. We'll see how yeah. it, it, everything ultimately shakes out for him. Like Bronny, one way or the other is going to spend all most or all of next year in the G League, right? He's just not, he's in the developmental phase. He only played right. a, it was a dozen or so college basketball games. So I, I, I don't think any team but the Lakers will draft him. That's my guess right now. But I do think the Lakers at 55, where virtually no one of any consequence has ever been drafted before, I do think they'll use that pick uh, on Bronny. Well, technically, you know, Man- Manu Ginobili went 59 to the Spurs, but it's, it's highly unlikely you're going to get a star in that spot. Uh, but that does add intrigue to the second night of the draft. This is the first year the NBA is doing two nights. Now, the second round is typically, as Manning said, a, a yawner, but because of the Bronny intrigue and, you know, could a team jump up before 55 and dare LeBron to go there? Yeah, maybe they could, but uh, more than likely if he gets drafted, he's going to get drafted by the Lakers and what the Wizards do on Thursday night, uh, we'll have to see. Uh, coming up, we'll get to 14 years ago today when John Wall went number one to the Wizards. It's the Andy Poland Show, ESPN 630. The Andy Poland Show on ESPN 630, the sports capital. Tony's coming up at 11 o'clock. we got some breaking news from the NBA, not unexpected. The Cleveland Cavaliers have hired Warriors assistant Kenny Atkinson as their next coach, uh, so they move on. I thought uh, Bernie Bickerstaff's kid... Did a pretty good job there, but uh, that's not the case in the NBA. If, uh, if, if if somebody wants to move on, sometimes it's a player, sometimes it's, it's an executive. As we saw with Monty Williams, it's the owner who's willing to pay out $65 million for him not to coach. Then it happens, and, uh, and the carousel moves on. So uh, 14 years ago, the Wizards having gone through unbelievable turmoil. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to imagine this. But uh, going into the 2009-2010 season, they were expected to be a, a, a team that could perhaps, you know, even contend uh, in the East, maybe even get to the Eastern Conference Finals. They had uh, Antoine Jameson, um, they had Karan Butler, and they had Gilbert Arenas. And with those three, there was, you know, hopes that if everything broke right, you know, and they, they could do things – And then Gilbert brought guns in the locker room, and everything imploded from there. Um, He was suspended for the rest of the year. They traded Jamison and Butler, and they were a bad team. Bad enough that they earned the number one pick in the draft, although that had some drama to it as well. Uh, Abe Poland had uh, sold the team, and uh, and they sent uh, Irene Poland to the lottery. And uh, and it's kind of like a last act as uh, as ownership because you know Abe Poland had bought out his partners with the Baltimore Bullets in 1964, passed away in Thanksgiving of 2009. So it gets to the 2010 draft lottery, and Irene in that uh, yellow jacket that she was wearing proved to be a good luck charm, and it's a it's an iconic photo of her with her mouth wide open like. <gasps> We got the number one pick, and uh, there was no question that it was going to be John Wall that year. And, in fact, 14 years ago today with the then late great commissioner, uh, David Stern, announcing it, that's exactly what happened. With the first pick in the 2010 NBA draft, the Washington Wizards select John Wall from the University of Kentucky. And things went you know, pretty well. He, uh, as a rookie, averaged 16 points a game. Second year, uh, although he missed some games, played only uh, 64 and 66 games those first two years, averaged 16 a game. Year three, the 2012-2013 season, had a knee injury, played only 42 games, but when he played, he played well, 18 and a half points a game. His fourth year, he plays 82 games. So he's clearly come back from the knee injury. 
He's playing well. He has the best year of his career, averages 19 points a game and 10 assists. I mean, he's having a, he's having a really good year. Then the 2014-2015 season, which is year number five, another good season, 17 points a game, 10 assists. 15-16, good year, plays 77 games, 19.9 a game. Then it comes to the 16-17 season, and it's a contract year. And he does everything he could possibly do that year. He has a 78-game regular season, averages 23 points and 10 rebounds a game. More importantly, is spectacular in Game 6 of a series that could get them to the Eastern Conference Finals against the Celtics, the Eastern Conference Semifinals. And unfortunately, it was game six. Now, he stood on the scorer's table and celebrated his great game, but then they got to game seven in Boston. He was out of gas, and uh, they didn't win. But it was a wait-until-next-year circumstance, and people were feeling good about John Wall at this point in his career. Remember, he played only his freshman year at Kentucky, so he's still a very young player six years into his career, and the future looks incredibly bright. Bright enough so that on July 26th of 2017, coming off this spectacular performance against the Boston Celtics and stepping up to the level where many think he can be an elite player, he has given a four-year, $170 million contract and became emotional about it at a news conference and had to be consoled and supported by the owner, Ted Leonsis. Losing my dad at nine, it, it made my mom become a woman that I don't think so many women could do in this world of working three to four jobs and having six sisters and two brothers and uh, just had to work extra hard. So I had to become a man quicker than I wanted to. And uh, my whole thing was I was put on this earth to do something and I was blessed to be able to play basketball. But my main thing was to keep striving and be a better person. That's one thing my mom always instilled in me was it doesn't matter what nobody thinks of you as a basketball player. They're always going to look at you as a person first. And uh, you can start off with my grandma at the end. She really can't really travel as much, but whenever she gets the opportunity, she, she beats her. Uh, you go to my two aunts right there. Uh, when I didn't have nothing, I can ask them for anything. You go to my sister, my two sisters in the front row. They push me to do stuff, and I'm pushing my younger sister to finish college. I mean, you be the first one in our family to do that. Then you go to my mom. You know what I mean? Words. Uh, Words can't even explain what. Um... Here's Ted. Apple doesn't fall far from the tree. <laughs> and, um, you know, John is our leader um, in creating a family environment. I think this is indicative um, that his family's all here and. It's a very genuine relationship that he has with his mother and grandmother and sisters and the like, and it's really wonderful to see. Well, uh, then then things start to turn south. He's got this big new $140 million contract. Comes the 17-18 season, he gets hurt. Uh, This is a guy who's been ball dominant. He scores a lot of points. He's got incredible speed end-to-end. But while he's out, the team is winning. And they start to make remarks in the locker room like, hmm, how about that? We're winning and John Wall is out. Uh, This was Wall during that period with Michael Smith on ESPN. Your team is winning. Uh, They're passing the ball more based on the numbers without you. Pretty high assist percentage. So your backcourt mate Bradley Beal comes out and says, everybody eats. When you first heard that, did you know that he was quoting paid in full? Or did you take it as a shot at you, as a lot of people did on the outside? Well, I said everybody eats before last year and the year before that. So, I mean, I really didn't pay it no mind. I just kind of brushed it off. And, I mean, like, we always have a motto on our team is next man is up. Everybody has to step up if somebody's down. So, I really didn't take it nowhere until I heard it again, like, the second time after the next game. But I was listening to what everybody else was saying. And then you have uh, Gortat, Marcin Gortat tweeted, hey, this is a great team win. You retweeted it with the LOL and then deleted. What was up with that? No, nah, I didn't delete it. Somebody else deleted it for me. You know what I mean? I stand on what I say. But um, it was funny when I put laugh out loud because it was just the way he put the team. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. The way he put the team in the, in, in the little exclamation points. And I'm like, whoa. But it is what it is. Everybody has their own opinion. They say it's what they say. Uh, I know what I do and what I bring to a team. I know I'm a team player. Um, I average almost 10 assists a game. I'm very prideful in finding my teammates and getting these guys easy shots. 
And it was more just shocking to hear from him and understanding that he gets the most assists from me and the most spoon-fed baskets ever. <laughs> so, and Bradley Bill, in fairness, did come back and say, it'd be crazy to say that we're better without John Wall. But like you said, you heard it again after another win and then the Gortat sweet, uh, tweet situation. So given what you bring to the team and what you've done over the years for these guys, how does that make you feel, this talk or the perception that they're taking shots at you, saying that they're better without you? How does that make you feel? Uh, I feel like just, it don't really make me feel too way. It just made me feel like they're, it wasn't classy the way they said it. You know what I mean? That's all it was. It really wasn't professional and classy to me. I feel like if you have a problem, you can get my phone number, you can talk to me personally. So that was John Wall uh, during that season after he signed the contract, and it pretty much became moot after that. He played only 41 games that season, 32 the next, tore his Achilles, uh, missed the entire 1920 season, 2019-2020. He was getting ready to come back. They were saying all the right things. He looks great in practice. He's ready to resume his career. And then they traded him for Russell Westbrook. He goes to Houston by mutual agreement. He sits out the entire season. So he's missed two full seasons. Plays the 2021 season, 40 games for the Rockets. Finally, uh, after sitting out another year, they, he winds up with the Clippers to finish out his career. So uh, during the 2022-23 season, played 34 games, finished his career averaging 19 points and, uh, what, nine assists a game. Not a great shooter, 32% uh, three-point shooter, 43% uh, field goal shooter. Just, you know, didn't quite live up to everything. Gave us some good moments, some exciting moments. When he was great, he was exciting to watch. But by and large, for a guy who went number one, number one, with great expectations to rebuild the franchise, it just never really happened, and we'll see. Is uh, is the new guy, the new guy who they get at number two on Thursday night, uh, going to have a better career or a similar career or no career at all? Who knows? But uh, all the hopes and dreams of John Wall, well, they weren't quite achieved. He did give us some moments in Washington. So there you go. That's a wrap on that, and that's a wrap for me. Tony is coming up next, and I'll see you back here tomorrow morning at 9 a.m.